The NATO countries of Poland and Slovakia are sending 33 MiG-29 replacement fighter jets to Ukraine in an effort to regain some of the lost air capabilities. However, aviation experts are questioning just how much of an impact the 1980s old Soviet aircraft technology could really hope to have on the modern battlefield. Ukrainian pilots are insisting they need Western American F-16s to dominate the skies. But the thing is, the Grandpa F-16 is just as old as the MiG-29. So, so what's all that about? How will these new replacement jets be useful, especially leading up to the upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive? Despite heavy losses, the Ukrainian Air Force is currently sustaining five brigades operating supersonic fighters. This is about a hundred jets, so adding another 30 or so is nothing small. They will be allowing Ukrainian pilots to be utilized in a better way. What I mean by this is that they're going to provide crucial tactical spacing in order to focus on maintenance and continue to keep pressure on Russian air forces to prevent an air advantage in their favor. Ukraine began the war with a stock of about 50 operational MiG-29 fulcrums that they had inherited from the Soviet Union after its collapse. Today, the Ukrainian Air Force is estimated to have lost 17 as of April 2023. The fulcrum was used extensively by both countries, with the famous Ukrainian Ghost of Kiev himself being a MiG-29 pilot, with heroic tales of shooting down multiple enemy jets. Although it turned out that specific pilot didn't actually exist, the air combat that the stories are based Based on did. Thanks to social media, we can now experience the conflict through the eyes of the real life Ukrainian MiG-29 pilots like Major Vadim Voyashov, call sign Karaya, who managed to shoot down five Iranian Shahed-136 Kamikaze drones and two cruise missiles before being hit by debris from one of the enemy drones that he had just hit and then he was forced to eject to safety. In fact, when we dig deep into the actual numbers, the majority of combat aircraft lost on both sides aren't from air-to-air -air dogfights that the F-16 would have a major edge in, but instead, they're suffering from a very similar vulnerability that ground armored vehicles are facing. Man-portable guided munitions fired from the Igloo launcher and the S-300 and ground-fired cruise missiles make up over half of aircraft lost in the war so far. So for instance, seven Ukrainian MiG-29s were lost while on the ground at their respective air bases from two separate Russian missile strikes. Eight were lost in various forms of air combat, including enemy jets and ground fire. However, the lack of air-to-air -air losses are likely because the fulcrum doesn't have the capabilities needed to confidently engage in that kind of combat. Ukraine, for their part, has successfully downed over 70 Russian combat aircraft using these same techniques. This has led to Russia failing to gain air superiority and also largely avoiding flying their advanced aircraft anywhere near the front lines anymore. So instead of dogfights, which do happen, what we're mainly observing is one of the main missions that the MiG-29 has been very useful for, which is hunting down and destroying the 440 pound Iranian made kamikaze drones and enemy cruise missiles in mid flight. The War Zone, a publication run by aviation expert Tyler Rajoy, recently pointed out how the fulcrum has had some great success in spite of some of its limited capabilities and armament. This jet typically flies air defense sorties with two radar guided R 27 missiles and four heat seeking R 73S. If you follow MiG 29 TikTok, then you've probably seen the great at operator thunder videos told from the point of view of a missile guidance system rapidly on its way to ruin a Russian MiG-29 pilot's day. Look at that MiG-29. Look at that dumb <laughs> idiot doesn't even know I'm locked onto him. McCoyan really thought they could make something as good as an F-16. But according to the war zone, these heat seeking missiles are not the best option for shooting down tiny drones that have limited infrared signatures. Two of the most important pieces of technology in a fighter jet is its radar detection system and its fire control system. There have been a number of different types of MiG-29 radar variants and firing systems over the decades that range from 35 kilometers detection range and one single target lock to the more advanced N-02 Zuhook ME radar with a maximum detection range of 120 kilometers in head-on and 50 kilometers in pursuit in open space. And its fire control system is capable of tracking an additional 10 targets and engaging four targets at once. So the MiG Fulcrum has seven hardpoints, three on each wing and one under the fuselage. 
all capable of carrying a combination of guided or unguided munitions. The Fulcrum even has the option to forego these fancy rockets and missiles and choose to carry six Fab 500 665 kilogram bombs to take out ground targets the old fashioned way. For context, the upgraded F-16S new AESA radar can track up to 20 targets at one time. Lockheed officials say it helps the F-16 pilots see a wider range in laterally, horizontally, diagonally, and vertically. It's also used in the F-35 and can detect enemies up to 200 kilometers away, nearly twice the distance of the MiG. So this is why Ukrainian pilots want the F-16, even though it's technically just as old as the MiG-29. It's been upgraded since the 1980s with modern weapons and radar technology. As an average infantryman, a dummy ground pounder the way I look at it, the F-16 and the MiG Fulcrum is like the difference between using a rifle with just iron sights or a rifle with fancy high-tech scopes. It's like how a burrito is only as good as its payload of meat and cheese that you put in. But the MiG Fulcrums that were donated by the West weren't without its own set of problems and controversy. There were reports of sabotage on the planes by potentially Russian mechanics who were working on the aircraft in Slovakia. But before we get into that, this video is sponsored by our partner, Navy Federal Credit Union, who's currently celebrating their 90th birthday. Right from the start, their mission has been to support the military community. Whether you're a brand new Space Force graduate or military family member, Navy Federal has you covered. Since they're a not-for-profit financial institution and member-owned, they're able to offer great rates, low fees, and exclusive member discounts that could earn and save members $349 per year. And they have an average credit APR that's 5% lower than the industry average. Navy Federal Credit Union service is especially tailored to our community, offering resources that aid transition to civilian life and plenty of other helpful articles in addition to being a top VA loan lender. And since they've recently lowered their VA mortgage rates, it may be the right time for you to look at using your VA home loan benefits. They've got award-winning stateside 24-7 customer service, so they're always there when you need them. All you have to do is click the link in the description to find out more about how Navy Federal can help serve your financial needs. Defects appeared in the fulcrum parts that were only possible to be accessed by these civilian Russian contractors. The Slovak defense minister first claimed it was the fault of the Russian contractor mechanics, and he even had the police run a full investigation. Many people were wondering if allowing Russian contractors to work on these fighter jets that are being sent to Ukraine to fight other Russians, it was a good idea. The problem was there wasn't exactly a ton of options when it comes to finding experts to work on the planes that they had been sitting around since 1993. However, these accusations were determined to be unfounded and the official investigation at least found that these technical problems with the aircraft had no evidence of sabotage. We don't know, maybe it was those mechanics, but they couldn't find evidence. But what the investigation found was that the faults with the old airframes were very real. Evidence of this was the fact that the engine that was supposed to last 350 hours only lasted 78 hours before failing and prevented some of the aircraft from flying combat missions. This brought up the question of if these aircraft would really be able to operate effectively enough to make any kind of difference in the war. This is yet another reason why Ukraine is asking for more advanced, better maintained F-16s. The MiG-29 Fulcrum models sent to Ukraine were decades old and far behind the power curve of modern aeronautic engineering. Aeronautical, aeronautical. So the new components that are being added to the fighters are gonna be the Rockwell Collins Navigation Secure Communication System, Identification Friend or Foe Systems, which are important because there have been friendly fire incidents on both sides with aircrafts, and new cockpit computers and LCD displays supported by a digital processor. We just turned that Game Boy into a Game Boy Advance. Remember the famous Ukrainian pilot we talked about before, Major Vadim Voroshov? He had a quote about how the F-16 would help in the counteroffensive. He said, right now, we can only hold the enemy, but with F-16s, we could control the air as well as the seas and the ground to protect infantry. And that's a major mission for the fighters in Ukraine to protect their advancing ground forces. It's a lot easier to assault a trench when you don't have Su-25s dive bombing your location. Then there is yet another piece to the equation, which is the armor. The R-27R missile, for instance, has a minimum engagement range that might force fighter pilots to back off and maintain distance before even having a chance to fire. But fear not, mounted in the container just to the left of the cockpit sits the GSH 30mm 
Gladiator Auto Cannon, a unique design compared to other fighter cannons that typically use a revolver or Gatling type mechanism. The GSH uses a short recoil action, which results in reduced rate of fire, but saves on overall weight and size. It has a maximum firing rate of about 1800 rounds per minute, but typically it's used at 1500 rounds per minute. This is due to the fulcrum only carrying 100 rounds of cannon ammunition. For context, the F-16 20mm cannon has five times the amount of ammo, but the limited ammo helps reduce wear on the MiG's barrel, which has an incredibly short lifespan of only 2,000 rounds before needing to be replaced. Doing some quick maths, that means that the MiG-29 can only fire its cannon for a whopping four seconds before going dry and only one minute and 20 seconds before needing to completely replace the barrel entirely. I swear, I probably wouldn't have failed algebra class if we were solving for how long I could shoot a 30 millimeter cannon instead of how many apples some kid has after eating three of them. The short action recoil system of the cannon produces a much higher level of heat than other designs. And to counter this, the fulcrum uses a water tank that evaporates heat away as the cannon fires. I can hear the safety brief already, don't drink the cannon water. A final quirk of the weapon is that in order to clear any malfunctions, it literally uses a small explosive to fire a steel bolt through the side of the stock round, igniting the powder inside and blowing it out the front of the barrel. Russian problems require Russian solutions, as they say. However, we have to consider how much ammo Ukraine can stockpile for their jet fighters. While it definitely would be nice for Ukraine to get some F-16 fighter jets, we don't know how easily they could switch to producing munitions to restock those fighter jets. But fortunately, Ukraine already has an established domestic production base for their MiG Fulcrum air-to-air -air missiles, and here we see them preparing the S-125 and R-73 anti-air guided missiles at their production facility. This is part of the reason why US officials have estimated that the fastest time frame they could meet for training and delivery of the F-16 and its munitions would be 18 months from now. Another piece of the puzzle to consider when looking at the MiG is its countermeasures. The newer MiG-29M variant has twice the amount of chaff flare dispensers with 60 rounds in each for a combined 120 flares to throw off incoming missile locks. To me, one of the most interesting things about the aircraft though is how the different systems come together. You got the countermeasures, armament, radar detection capability, fire control system, top speeds, and handling ability all at different altitudes that need to be considered. The MiG Fulcrum is ready now. It's like the AK-47 and T-72. It's just one of those Soviet designs that seemingly never go away, and it's still in active combat 40 years after its introduction in 1983. Reports show one of the important functions of the Fulcrum aircraft has been a method of gauging the location and strength of Russian positions based on detected signals of radar jamming, radar lock-on, and electronic warfare. For instance, if a pilot in the MiG is able to pick up a large concentration of electronic signals in a given area, like detecting an S-300 anti-air system, it's almost always a good indication that the enemy is attempting to protect something important there. This helps Ukraine's military leadership determine where the front lines are best defended by Russia like locations of Russian headquarters or the location of a high concentration of ground forces. This is a key piece of information that would allow for a more effective Ukrainian counterattack. That said, Ukraine has one major disadvantage in its use of MiG-29s versus Russia, and that's its vulnerability while not on mission. While Russia has the luxury of keeping their air fleet on their side of the border when not conducting combat operations, Ukraine's airfields are under constant threat of ballistic attacks. This might be one of the reasons why they're not sending the F-16. They're worried it's gonna get hit when it's on the ground. This has forced Ukrainian MiG-29s to constantly hop from one airfield to another to avoid these attacks and the loss of more jets, putting a massive strain on fuel and maintenance efforts. Combine the issues of airstrip hopping and overworked aircraft fighting in a hotly contested airspace multiple times a day with increasing mission requirements on a shrinking pool of aircraft to pull from, you could see how the Ukrainians are more than happy to receive these aircraft. MiG-29 aircraft, since the breakout of fighting, is still typically running at at least one or two sorties a day, with little to no time for maintenance or refitting, except for fuel and ammunition. But how does the MiG-29 fare in terms of its specifications? The Fulcrum began to enter service in August of 1983 with the Russian Air Force and a downgraded MiG-29B model, which quickly saw export soon after, and lacked many of the advanced avionic capabilities like long-range radar detection and multi-target lock. 
In fact, at least five of the MiGs going to Ukraine now originally came from Germany. They were used in the old East German fleet. So I don't know where those export models came from or not, or if they're just regular MiGs. The modern day MiG-29 will run you about $23 million, which when compared to other fourth generation fighters is an absolute steal, making it no surprise how popular an aircraft it was with foreign military purchase. The Fulcrum weighs in at about 24,000 pounds empty and about 32,000 pounds with fuel, leaving an extra 8,000 pounds of usable payload for cannon rounds and ammunition and missiles. The F-16 reportedly has about 15,000 pounds of payload capacity, so a little more. Unlike most fourth generation fighters, the MiG-29 uses old school hydraulics controls as opposed to fly by wire electronic controls. The climb rate of the MiG-29A was an impressive 330 meters per second. Its top speed was about 2,450 kilometers an hour at 11,000 meters altitude. So the modern MiG goes faster than the American F-22 and over 300 miles per hour faster than the F-35. This might seem backwards that an aircraft from 40 years ago can outrun the latest and greatest America has to offer. But this is an interesting capability relic of how air strategy was imagined during the Cold War. Back then, speed was king, but this was necessary due to the limitations of the munition guidance before the introduction of modern weapon systems that we have today. Greater ranges and speed of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles means that the need to close the gap between targets is not as important these days. And it would be uncommon to see a modern day fulcrum going full afterburner to engage a target. Now, of course, the MiG-29 isn't just for looking pretty and serving as a topic to argue on at video game forums and then to leak classified information to win said arguments. It carries a full spectrum of weapons in order to take on targets. A new addition to its capabilities is the American AGM-88 Harm Missile, an air to ground missile specifically designed for suppression of enemy air defense which identifies and targets Russian radar signatures and engages them before the aircraft itself is within enemy firing range. It sounds easy to just slap an American weapon onto a Russian jet, right? Well, not really, not even a little. That's like trying to fire a 7.62 bullet out of a 5.56 gun. It required a full reworking of the hardware and software for both the American missile and the Russian aircraft in order for the two to work together properly. If you thought buying a dongle to plug in your headphones was annoying, try having to rewrite the software for your phone and the headphones that were written in different languages while also building the dongle yourself from scratch. To put a point on it, one major reason Ukraine wants the F-16 instead, even though they're happy with the MiGs, is because the first time the MiG-29 saw full conventional air-to-air -air combat in Desert Storm, the Iraqi pilots were pitted against NATO Air Force pilots. All fulcrum engagements resulted in retreat, being shot down, or simply crashing, which would seem to indicate that American F-16s and F-18s sent to Ukraine could really help turn the the tide there. However, it could also possibly cross the vague so-called red line that Putin has claimed. That said, the overcompensation of the engines in the MiG-29 give it a thrust to weight ratio of 1.07, meaning for every pound of thrust, it only has to move 0.7 pounds of weight. Without getting too much into fractions and decimal points that make my tiny ground pounder head hurt, it means the aircraft is capable of an impressive feats and maneuverability, such as near vertical climbs, high angle of attack turns, and everyone's favorite move after watching the latest Top Gun movie, The Cobra Maneuver. A move so impressive, it made one YouTube commenter speechless, only able to respond with the highest endorsement possible, the thumbs up emoji. Hopefully one day I will earn the viewers likes and subscribes also. I don't know for sure, but I would assume the MiGs donated to Ukraine do not have the most advanced technology. Like we've seen with many of military donations to Ukraine, there's plenty of room for criticisms due to these replacement aircraft being older, but the reality is any plane is better than having your pilots without anything to fly. If you like the shirt that I helped design of the sexy buff Gumby operator, grab it from our store below. It helps me notice who's in the spare parts army if I run into one of you at a mall in New Jersey. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, ending transmission on this net, time now.